So, welcome to today's session on uh, blood transfusions to our uh, webinars, uh, Young India Intensivist. It is a very important one because of the complications that we have to deal with more than anything else. Un restricted use and overuse of blood transfusion. So the problem is actually overuse of blood transfusions and how best to avoid them. So we can give specific blood transfusions as required. Actually not covered in many webinars and go along we just keep giving blood as we learn from whatever we can in the area of the area where we are working. Of course the foremost area where uh, blood transfusions are used is hematology units, followed by that is ICU. ICU is the second area where maximum number of blood transfusions occur. So it's a very vital area for intensivists and I hope uh, you will find it useful. So the speaker today is uh, Dr. Asim K. Tewari, sir. Sir is Director at Medanta of Blood Transfusions, uh, Laboratory Medicine and Pathology. And uh, he will uh, speak to you with all his experience, you know, firsthand about blood transfusions. And uh, we thank him for sparing his time and making the presentation. And uh, for our valuable inputs from the clinical hematology point of view, uh, we have uh, Professor uh, Tulika Seth, ma'am. Ma'am is Professor, Department of Hematology, All India Institute of Medical Sciences. So if you have any queries regarding blood transfusion or regarding hematology, We'll be happy to take them. You have experts uh, in the form of uh, Professor Tulika, ma'am, and sir. So please put your questions. So uh, with that, uh, we will uh, start now. And ma'am, request you, if you want to make any comments at any particular point uh, during the session, please uh, make your comments. And of course, uh, whatever uh, you like to add at the end when we have some interaction, ma'am. Oh, so over to you, Tewari, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bansal. Uh, at the very outset, I will tell you that uh, uh, possibly if the website says it incorrectly, I'm not look, I don't look after pathology, I only look after the uh, transfusion medicine department. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. So this is the outline of the talk. I'll take around 30, 35 minutes and we'll understand why uh, rational use of blood is important. We'll also understand what are the strategies uh, to ensure that blood is used rationally. We'll very briefly understand blood loss and resuscitation, which of course intensiveness would know much better than me. Uh, we'll also talk about certain drugs which can be used as an alternative. We'll talk about how component therapy is better than the whole blood therapy. We'll talk about individual component guidelines, uh, the more generalized uh, guidelines, as well as uh, I have borrowed from uh, British uh, Journal of Hematology. So these are BCSH guidelines or British Journal of Hematology guidelines, which have been uh, quoted in this uh, talk. Uh, well, you briefly understand about autologous and inventory management as they are part of the uh, rational use of blood. Uh, we'll talk about availability and awareness. And in the end, we'll talk about the transfusion committee and the audit. So the uh, Professor Karl Landestiner, who's uh, received Nobel Prize for ABO Blood Group Discovery, also said that blood transfusion should never be ordered unless it is worth the risk. So that's a very, very important statement that it should only be ordered when uh, you have done a risk-benefit analysis and the benefit is more than the risk, uh, it should be ordered. Uh, the strategies are that uh, we should have guidelines for rational use of blood components and we should promote component therapy. We should encourage autologous blood donation, especially the one which is done in operation theater, like uh, pre-operative hemodilution. Uh, we can manage inventory of blood components. We'll talk about it a little more. Uh, ensuring availability and accessibility to blood components and the drugs which are used as alternative. Uh, also the awareness programs, uh, of course, uh, this group is a highly learned group, but you know, such awareness programs are needed in every part, uh, you know, where people may not be uh, really aware of entire thing and setting up a hospital transfusion committee and doing a transfusion audit to see whether uh, it is uh, being used rationally the way it is supposed to be. Uh, but even before we uh, talk about developing guidelines and promoting component therapy, we will really briefly understand the physiology and management of blood loss. 
uh, different kind of fluids which are used for resuscitation, the crystalloids, the colloids, and the plasma. Plasma is the blood component. Uh, certain pharmacological agents which are used as alternative. Uh, components, uh, how they are superior to whole blood. And uh, uh, about the most important blood components which we use uh, on a daily practice uh, basis. So we all understand that up to 10% of blood loss, nothing is required. In fact, when we donate blood as a donor, as a blood donor, we uh, you know, donate almost 10%. Uh, between 10 and 20%, possibly crystalloids and colloids are good enough. And it's only the loss is more than 20%, the blood components have a role to play. And the, the management is controlling the loss and managing normovolemia, monitoring the vitals, and, uh, you know, taking lab parameters like hemoglobin, PT, APT, T platelet counts, along with the clinical picture uh, on deciding upon the treatment. So now there's a very, uh, there is a very important term called patient blood management. So the, the management has to be tailor-made for that particular patient. It can't be generalized uh, for the entire category. Uh, there are three different important fluids which are used for resuscitation, the crystalloids, the colloids, and the plasma. The crystalloids are hypo-oncotic, which means that if we have to replace one liter, we'll have to give three liters, while colloid and plasma are iso-oncotic, which means to replace one liter, one has to give one liter. Crystalloids, uh, of course, uh, is a pharmaceutical product. There is no chance of transfusion, transmissible infections. Uh, neither colloid has any TTI risk, but plasma does have a TTI risk. Uh, crystalloid uh, does not have a risk of allergy. Colloid uh, has a very little risk of allergy, but plasma can have a risk of allergy. Uh, allergic reactions are more common with plasma products as, co uh, as compared to red cells. Uh, the advantage of crystalloid is that it is available at low cost. It is available even in a primary healthcare center. Colloid is expensive. The plasma cost is intermediate. Uh, and the advantage is that it does have coagulation factors and immunoglobulins, but the disadvantage is that uh, it contains citrate, which can cause chelation of uh, ionized calcium, and ABO group uh, compatibility has to be kept in mind when using plasma. So once we have understood these, uh, uh, you know, we will talk about certain pharmacological agents. Uh, vitamin K is the drug of choice when there is vitamin K deficiency or the warfarin reversal has to be done, or in case of hemorrhagic disease of newborn. Likewise, DDAVP or Desmopressin can be used in mild von Willebrand disease and mild hemophilia. In immune thrombocytopenic purpura, ATP, IVIG, or, and steroids is the treatment of choice, not the blood components. And likewise, uh, for heparin reversal, protamine uh, is the drug of choice. Uh, several antifibrinolytic agents like aprotenin and tranexamic acid are used uh, in many indications uh, these days. Uh, and for nutritional anemia, hematonics have to be used. Purified plasma fractions, which are uh, which the, the process of manufacturing involves the viral inactivation is far superior as compared to blood component and recombinant proteins wherever they are available, like erythropoietin, have to be used uh, over blood components. Now, why component therapy is superior to whole blood therapy? There are three reasons for that. The first, that different indications require different components. Reason number two, that different components have to be stored at different storage conditions. And third is that we all have a responsibility to conserve this scarce resource. And we'll talk about each one of them one after the other. Uh, so for example, if there is anemia, then the red cell is the component. If there is a platelet count which has dropped or the platelet function which is not perfect, then platelets have to be used. Uh, multiple clotting factor deficiency would need plasma and hemophilia A would require cryo. So if we give a whole blood which does not have functional platelets, which does not have Levi clotting factors, which is only going to work in anemia and not going to work in the other indications. Likewise, uh, different components uh, have different optimum storage conditions. So red cells have to be stored at four degrees uh, for a shelf life for 42 days. Plasma uh, has to be frozen within six hours of collection and has to be stored for one year. Platelets have to be stored at 22 degrees Celsius on a shaking platform for five days and cryo has to be stored at temperatures lower than minus 30 for a shelf life of one year. So again, uh, if we keep whole blood, we can keep it only at four degree and we lose other components. So it has to be uh, you know, split into components and separated and kept at their particular uh, conditions, optimum storage and temperature conditions. Uh, 
and of course this needs to be conserved because it's a scarce resource uh, we as a country don't have enough uh, uh, components for all our patients so it has to be conserved so the first component is the is the whole blood or what used to be called as packed cells uh, or semi packed cells uh, it's no longer used actually i'll i'll come to that a little later and uh, so it is either 350 or 450 ml blood in an appropriate anticoagulant Uh, but it is deficient in clotting factors the platelets become functionally inactive so what it provides is mainly red cells with unwanted and extra volume extra potassium and extra sodium so now we have a much uh, better product which is called red cell in additive solution so at a blood bank level what happens that you know we remove the entire plasma and suspend them in a solution which uh, has several advantages like the shelf life from 35 days become 42 days which is Seven days more. Uh, it has a better flow as compared to packed or a semi-packed, which were very difficult. They would get a stuck in the in the transfusion set while this flows like normal saline. And there is very little hemolysis because there are certain chemicals uh, preservatives which are there in the sagam. It is called saline, adenine, mannitol, and glucose, which preserve the red cells better. And since there is no plasma, there is uh, advantages. Is advantages are that there are fewer allergic reactions. because most of the actions are to plasma proteins and the groups can be switched now what do we mean by switching groups is that for example an ab group recipient can not only not only receive ab uh, he or she can also receive group a group b and group o so because there is no plasma we don't have to worry about the plasma component there is no minor cross match which is required so these are the advantages of red cell in additive solution so practically uh, almost every hospital now uses red cell in additive solution the indications are trauma we spoke uh, how more than 20% loss would need blood component uh, surgery anemia and radiotherapy now very important thing is that earlier the trigger uh, so called transfusion trigger used to be 10 g percent few years back uh, it has been reduced to 7 or 8 g percent now uh, and you know imagine the amount of difference that it would make to so many patients uh, and uh, it is not just the trigger which is important the rate of development of anemia the general condition the type of surgery so there are several variables which decide whether the patient would need transfusion or not not now these are uh, certain trials very very important trials which are uh, here as acronym the trick trial the trax trial and the focus trial uh, this has been borrowed from british journal of hematology now the guidelines the the practice guidelines that they advocate are the transfusion threshold of 7 g per deciliter or below with a hemoglobin range uh, of 9 g% 7 to 9 g% should be uh, default for all critically ill patients unless specific comorbidities or acute illness related factors modifies this clinical decision making transfusion trigger should not exceed 9 g per deciliter or 9 g per liter uh, 90 g per liter in most critically ill patient the icu patients erythropoietin should not be used to treat anemia in critically ill patients unless further safety and efficacy data are available uh, and the evidence base is insufficient to support routine administration of fresher blood to critically ill patients so these are uh, guidelines on management of anemia uh, and red cell transfusion in adult critically ill patients published in british journal of hematology 2012 Uh, and they also give this very beautiful algorithm uh, and you can see in this algorithm that uh, you know the the first step is whether the patient is anemic or not uh, if the patient is anemic if the hemoglobin is more than 9 g percent uh, you do not transfuse if the if the hemoglobin is less than 9 g percent uh, then you see whether the patient has acute coronary syndrome or sepsis or neurological injury and then they have again defined that Uh, if it is no then you continue to use your 7 to 9 g uh, window but uh, in case of sepsis the guidelines say that uh, you have to uh, see whether sepsis is early or late if the sepsis is early which is defined as 6 hours from the onset uh, and there is evidence of tissue hypoxia then you keep a slightly higher hemoglobin 9 to 10 if it is late then you are happy with anything above 7 Uh, in the traumatic brain injury you would like to keep a higher hemoglobin of 9 g percent in subarachnoid hemorrhage again you would want to keep a hemoglobin of 8 and 10 and uh, the ischemic heart again you would want to keep a higher hemoglobin of 8 or 9 
and patient with a stable angina, you're happy with seven. And look at this, what is very, very important here that uh, uh, be confident of using an hemoglobin trigger of seven gram per deciliter if the patient is younger than 55 and the patient's severity of illness is relatively low. Uh, I'm sorry, one second. Uh, the patient uh, be less confident of using this trigger if the patient is elderly with significant cardiorespiratory comorbidity and the patient has evidence of inadequate oxygen supply to the tissues. So the decision making if uh, uh, uses this algorithmic approach, then uh, you know we ensure that the blood is used rationally. This algorithm is taken from British Journal of Hematology. Uh, for red cell, the dose is one unit would, of red cell would increase the hemoglobin of, by one gram percent. Uh, it is administered to a standard transfusion set and ABURH match and cross matching has to be done before it is issued from the bank. Uh, I would not go into this detail, but the point is that uh, different groups can be used in the recipient depending on this uh, checkerboard of uh, how you can use different groups. So we have recipient here and we have donor here. So we'll take one example. Uh, so, for example, in AB group that I spoke earlier, you can use all the donor groups, the AB, the B, A, and A. Likewise, in B, you can use B and O. So, this is what it is. Uh, and uh, even uh, RH positive blood can be used in RH negative. And this is one of our studies published in Indian Journal of Medical Research. Uh, sometimes you have to use RHD uh, as uh, uh, sort of uh, as a planned deliberately uh, when you don't have enough inventory. So this was a deliberate uh, issue in certain patients who were elderly males and waiting for liver transplant. Uh, and we had seven such patients who received four to 20 uh, RHD positive intraoperatively and three patients also received one to two uh, RHD positive red cells postoperatively, but none of these patients developed NTD antibody during 12 weeks of follow-up. So. Uh, even uh, in certain categories like elderly male, the RH positive can be used in RH negative if the inventory uh, uh, issues are there with a particular blood center or a blood bank. Uh, the second most important component is platelets and platelets are uh, primarily of two kinds, the random donor platelets and single donor platelets. Uh, the random donor platelets are derived from whole blood. These are the commoner platelets as we understand. Uh, they have around 50 ml of plasma and the count is around 5 into 10 to the power 10. Uh, the other one which is uh, obtained by an apheresis uh, equipment is uh, has slightly higher plasma 200 to 300 ml and the count is 30 into 10 to the power 10. So this is uh, practically six times more potent as compared to random donor platelets. However, uh, six random donor platelets and one single donor platelets would have the same clinical efficacy. Uh, the indications are either the production has gone down as would happen in aplasia or neoplasia or the usage has gone up as would happen in thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura or DIC or the destruction has gone up as would happen in uh, immune thrombocytopenic purpura or everything is all right but they get sequestered because of hyperesplenism or there are functional defects. This is a generalized uh, uh, sort of uh, way of explaining and uh, you know remembering the indications for platelets. Uh, and these are the guidelines which say that, you know, if the uh, count is more than uh, between 50 and 1 lakh, transfusion is usually not required. Uh, if the counts are between 50 and 20 uh, and the patient uh, is symptomatic uh, or the patient has to undergo surgery and trauma, then of course the platelets have to be given. Uh, and the, uh, if the count, has, count is lower than 20,000 per microliter, the risk of bleeding is high and prophylactic transfusion may be indicated, not just therapeutic, but even prophylactic, even before bleeding symptoms are there, it has to be done. But a more uh, uh, specific guidelines is from British Journal of Hematology again. Uh, and before we talk about uh, the platelet and the plasma, we need to understand that there is a WHO bleeding score. Uh, grade zero means no bleeding. Grade ones mean petechiae, percura, which is localized to one or two dependent sites, uh, or oropharyngeal bleeding, epistex is less than 30, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, the, the prophylactic transfusion is when the bleeding score is between 0 and 1. Uh, and it is called therapeutic if it is grade 2, grade 3 or grade 4. So this understanding is very important that uh, what is prophylactic transfusion in case of uh, uh, bleeding uh, and what is therapeutic. So 0 and 1 uh, 
uh, if the grade zero and one, which is milder bleeding, then it is prophylactic. If it is two, three, and four, then it is considered therapeutic transfusion of platelets. Uh, and we'll understand which are the common procedures or surgery where prophylactic use is uh, there. So whenever possible, use a procedure on equipment uh, associated with the lowest bleeding risk. Apply local measures such as compression to reduce the risk of bleeding post-procedure. Do not give platelet transfusion routinely in cases of bone marrow aspirate or pick lines uh, or traction removal of tunneled uh, central venous catheters and cataract surgery. These are specific guidelines from British Society of Hematology. Uh, consider performing following procedures above the platelet count mentioned against them. So, for example, venous central lines uh, can be inserted if the count is more than 20. Lumbar puncture can be done at the count of more than 40. Insertion, removal of epidural catheter, you have to have a count of 80,000 uh, per microliter. Uh, for a major surgery, you have to have a count of more than 50. And for any neurosurgical procedure or ophthalmic surgery involving the posterior segment of the eye, the platelet count has to be more than 1 lakh for, a, for the surgery to be undertaken. So these are specific uh, guidelines. Of course, there are many more. There are, many, there are different for uh, patients of hematology, which cannot be covered in this talk. So uh, there are much more to this, but these are general. And for therapeutic, uh, uh, there is if the patient is with bleeding, that is not considered severe or life-threatening. The count can be maintained at above 30. Uh, in severe bleeding, maintain the count above 50. Consider empirical use uh, for the initial management, especially in the initial management of the major hemorrhage till you are sure about the cause. Uh, in the patient with multiple trauma, traumatic brain injury or spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage, the count has to be maintained at 1 lakh, above 1 lakh uh, per uh, microliter or 100 into 10 to the power 9 per liter. Uh, the, the dose of platelet is 1 unit per 10 kg, which roughly is around 6 uh, random donor platelets or 1 single donor platelets. Uh, it has to be preferably ABO and RH matched, uh, but this is not essential uh, and many a times not possible because you do not have a very large inventory of platelets. Red cells, you have a bigger inventory usually. Platelets, uh, usually blood centers have a smaller inventory. And this is again... Uh, there is a way of uh, deciding which can be used and this depends on the antibodies uh, in the platelet uh, and the plasma component, whether it is uh, compatible with the red cell of the recipient. So, for example, uh, here AB group plasma, AB group platelets are universal, while in the red cell, the O group is universal. And of course, uh, this is the uh, way of using it. Uh, even platelets uh, can be used, uh, RH positive platelets can be used in RH negative recipient. Uh, this is again one of the studies which was published in ISBT science series. Uh, and we had a total of 332 RH negative patients who received 1996 D positive platelet. Uh, and the median follow up was seven weeks. Uh, and the anti D, which was detected in only three D negative patients at five, eight, and 24 weeks. And this works out to be 0.9%. So there is a risk of developing an anti D antibody, but the risk is very, very low. Uh, and uh, uh, especially in a fragmented blood services uh, that we have in the country where each hospital has its own small blood center, uh, it may not be possible to give RH negative to RH negative. Then you have to, uh, you know, see which patients can receive. So especially the males. Uh, and, uh, you know, especially uh, post-menopausal post women can receive uh, even RH positive if the inventory is an issue. Uh, the third important component is fresh frozen plasma. It is obtained by centrifugation of whole blood or plasmapheresis. Uh, frozen within six hours, uh, shelf life is min one year at minus 30 or lower, and it has to be thawed and used uh, within four hours after thawing. Uh, and we have uh, defined the indications as definite indications, conditional indications, and the indications which have no justification. The individual factor deficiency, congenital, where you don't have that particular factor, or reversal of warfarin, vitamin K deficiency uh, would require vitamin K, but vitamin K would require around 12 to vitamin K injection would take around 12 to 18 hours before it reaches liver and starts producing uh, uh, vitamin K dependent clotting factors in, during those 12 to 18 hours if the patient is bleeding uh, FFP may be indicated thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura the plasma exchange is done with plasma 
uh, and disseminated intravascular coagulation. These are definite indications. The conditional indications are massive transfusion, liver disease, and cardiopulmonary bypass, which means that they may not always be required. Uh, the the decision making has to be individualized to a patient, and there is no justification to use uh, it for hypovolemia or nutritional deficiency, which is not justified scientifically. Uh, these are specific guidelines from British Society of Hematology, uh, and uh, the uh, guidelines refer to both FFP and cryoprecipitate. They call both of them as plasma components. Uh, this says that abnormal PT and APTT are poor predictors of bleeding risk in non-bleeding patients prior to an invasive procedure. So what is more important is, is the uh, history of uh, bleeding and drug history and uh, risk associated uh, with the planned procedure must be assessed routinely for all patients undergoing a planned procedure. Uh, standard coagulation test should be considered in patients who have high, moderate or high bleeding risk or those who are on anticoagulants, very common to have patients on antiplatelets these days or those who have a bleeding history. Uh, patients with positive uh, bleeding history should be discussed with hematology because sometimes uh, even the clotting test may be normal uh, while there may be a bleeding tendency. So this is one uh, caveat which we need to remember. Uh, the impact of commonly used doses of FFP to correct clotting results or to reduce the bleeding risk is very limited, uh, particularly when the INR is between 1.5 and 1.9. Uh, there is insufficient evidence on which to base a recommendation about the threshold of fibrinogen level to transfuse cryo uh, or the optimal dose in the patient with hypofibrogenemia undergoing procedures. But generally, uh, one gram per liter or 100 uh, milligram per deciliter is considered all right. Uh, and generally, a two, a 10 uh, cryoprecipitates are given to an adult patient. So these are specific guidelines from British Society of Hematology. Uh, in general, the dose is 10 to 15 ml per kg. Uh, it has to be thawed the way plasma is thawed, and preferably it has to be ABO incompatible. Uh, again, British Journal of Hematology say that ABO identical plasma, uh, non-identical plasma is also acceptable. Uh, the only thing is that O group sometimes may have high teeter uh, NTA or NTB. Therefore, O plasma should only be given to O plasma, but otherwise in non-O group, uh, the other group plasma can be used. And for RH negative patients, RHD plasma can be given. So practically plasma or cryo, uh, there is no need even to label for RH uh, and no NTD profile access uh, is uh, required or mandated. Uh, the fourth important component that we are going to talk about uh, and the last in the components uh, is the cryoprecipitate. Uh, it has to be thawed and stored at minus, uh, it is um, made by thawing plasma FFP. Uh, stored at minus 30 and it has to be thawed and used within four hours. Uh, and the indications are hyperfibrogenemia. We spoke about it. Uh, and uh, the dose in administration, this is uh, generally one unit per 10 kg body weight for an adult, which means around 10 bags at a time. Uh, thawed at 37 and any ABO and RH group uh, can be used for cryoprecipitate. Uh, now, after having spoken about the, uh, the resuscitation, the drugs and the components, uh, we need to understand that uh, when we talk of uh, trauma care, that sometimes uh, what is important is uh, airway, breathing, and circulation. Of course, uh, you as intensivist would uh, be much more learned about it. The point that I want to make is that sometimes uh, in such uh, ambulances and air ambulances, sometimes all that you have are crystalloids, colloids, uh, AB plasma, and O negative cells. And sometimes these are manned by paramedical uh, staff uh, and uh, so what is more important is to uh, uh, maintain a normal volemia and to do the resuscitation as quickly as possible within those early hours, which are very crucial, uh, rather than having the, uh, you know, likewise, autologous transfusion uh, lead to optimization of, uh, they reduce the uh, dependence on the allogenic transfusion. Uh, there is no risk of allergic reaction or disease transmission because it is one's own uh, blood. Uh, and the commonest is what is done in operation theater by anesthetist is the preoperative hemodilution. And sometimes uh, you also use salvage uh, procedures uh, uh, in the, uh, if the cavity, if the cavity where you're operating is uh, not, is not infected, uh, then even salvage can be used. Now, inventory management is very important uh, principle of uh, ensuring rational use of blood. The first principle is first in, first out. 
so naturally uh, there are only very few category of patients where we would give fresher blood for example in our institution we would reserve it uh, uh, only for neonates which is less than 1 month uh, baby less than 1 month uh, or thalassemia major uh, or uh, cardiac surgery which is uh, especially if the patient is on pump cardiac surgery which is actually less common these days so these are the only three indications where we would use blood which is not fifa but in all the other uh, patient indications it is the uh, oldest unit which is issued first we spoke about switching groups and this is a very very important principle of inventory management so uh, i i would repeat again that in ab patient would receive can receive ab b a and o uh, and you know this way you can overcome the inventory issues the platelet and cryo can be given non group specific and we saw the publications also from india uh, plasma need to be only abo specific we need not worry about rh and sometimes even rh positive can be used in rh negative we spoke about Uh, elderly male and liver transplant as a specific uh, uh, patient population now awareness program is very important so uh, you know especially in the periphery people need to understand how component therapy is better than the whole blood uh, what are the guidelines on the rational use we spoke about british journal of hematology which is a beautiful resource uh, if somebody has to refer to uh, we need to understand that there are certain blood sparing te techniques like uh, preoperative dilution and salvage and there are several drugs which can be used as alternatives uh, a hospital transfusion committee is there in a hospital which comprises of both the users the physicians the surgeons the obstetricians and the providers uh, blood bankers like myself and this committee formulates policies for the use of blood components developing guidelines for the use uh, establishing surgical blood order schedule monitoring sources supply uh, ordering uh, monitoring adverse uh, effects and uh, uh auditing the blood transfusion uh, services uh, transfusion audit is a management tool which is to analyze the data of current practices to find trend uh, and uh, make appropriate changes in the policy as a follow up if needed uh, and which has to be on the basis of agreement of user and the provider one example is that when uh, the world shifted from whole blood to components uh, people would use one unit of red cell and one unit of ffp and practically reconstitute blood Uh, during the time of infusion uh, and uh, there was an audit which uh, said that plasma would only be issued if the uh, inr is more than 1.5 uh, otherwise it would not be issued so it was a decision taken by the uh, committee uh, and uh, again an audit was conducted and it was found that the usage of ffp came down dramatically so it is very important to have uh, certain uh, guidelines and certain Uh, you, you know parameters of use to ensure uniformity and to ensure the rational use of blood so it is not about uh, you know throughout the presentation of course we have been <laughs> discouraging blood component use but it is not uh, that it has it should not be used the the idea is that it should be the right product in the right dose at the right time and for the right reason uh, thank you very much okay so uh, that's very nice and uh, informative talk but just like to you know uh, address some practical issues that our intensivists have while transfusing blood you know a day to day practice so either you or ma'am can help the audience our young intensivists so i have a series of points the first is that what temperatures are should be generally transfused in blood once you get uh, packs and for example uh, you need a warmer for massive transfusion but for uh, one or two uh, packs and what temperature is uh, required right so the moment you receive blood transfusion you can begin it it, okay. it does not matter because the 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 rate at which it goes uh, it reaches the core temperature of body immediately so it's only in massive transfusion that you would think of warm warmers okay. if warmer has to be used and it has to be an fda approved warmer which is uh, there in the in the transfusion set uh, otherwise uh, you know warmer can also be dangerous so a practice of warming blood is not at all required uh if dr tulika wants to add uh, ma'am please ma'am uh, you'll have to just press the button for unmuting uh dinesh okay yeah thank you thank you so i completely agree uh, blood warmers uh, are only required in newborns or in massive transfusions by warming blood you may actually cause more problems um, uh, and so it should not be a, a routine practice okay second so for each of the transfusion that is uh, pack cell and ffp and stp 
what is the ideal time over which they should be transfused yes all the components uh, should be uh, as i said sh you should begin the transfusion the moment you receive them uh, and uh, it should preferably be completed within 4 hours and the logic of this 4 hours is that you know blood is a very potent uh, uh, you know culture media for bacteria so if it remains at that temperature for a very long time and it's an open system because you have you know put in a spike to you know uh, you know allow it to go into the patient then there is a chance of bacteremia and sepsis so 4 hours uh, is a thumb rule sir How and sdp that it doesn't mean that it, if it is going to be 4 and a half hours it is going to be a very bad thing but the principle is that it should be completed within 4 hours and for ffp and sdp sir ffp would uh, be transfused within half an hour or something Similarly, for for platelets, uh, the only uh, caveat to that, I completely agree with Sir about the four hours. The only thing is that the uh, volume of blood will depend also on the hemoglobin hematocrit of the patient. So, if a patient has a very very low hemoglobin of three or four, then you have to give the blood more slowly. If so, uh, it's very important because otherwise, such patients may go into pulmonary edema. I can be beyond four hours, ma'am, because there's a risk of uh, uh, infection. Also, if you, like sir said, uh, if you go beyond four hours, I mean, uh, the risk of pulmonary edema. Ma'am, you have got muted. Uh, Dinesh, ma'am, go mute. Karo. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, in such a case, sometimes if it's going over a very long time, if the hemoglobin is very uh, slow, then you may also discard the unit if it's going, especially if it's in summers. Uh, uh, or you can even talk to the blood bank. I think that's where it's very important to have a, a good communication with the blood bank, and you can then ask for a, a smaller unit. But uh, uh, the the patient's stability is most important. So if uh, If the patient is going into pulmonary edema, um, goes very slow. What we usually say is, if your hemoglobin is three, then you give three mL per kg per hour. You know, so you want to go as low as you can for these patients with very low hemoglobin. Though, of course, this is a very rare situation. Most of the time, uh, you're not seeing that. If your hemoglobin is six or seven, then you can uh, four hours is perfectly fine. So, ma'am, uh, giving this slowly. uh that would apply to chf patients also sometimes yes especially for these patients yeah. and so here, uh, here can we use a pediatric rbc say you know they have a smaller amount than you know? that that is a great way of conserving uh, you know, your blood because you don't want to discard it and uh, the blood bank will often help you and give you these smaller units for such patients so that there's no wastage of blood as it's such a precious resource Yeah. So if if you want to give a smaller amount, you can probably use pediatric RBCs. Give it over four hours. Give it a gap, and then give the next. Uh, uh, Absolutely. Uh, yes. Okay. So S, uh, what about SDP, ma'am? SDP has to go over like uh, half an hour, or what? Is SDP should be given. Quickly, and it should be transfused as soon as you get it from the blood bank. Many times we see that uh, the SDP is kept on the counter, and they're waiting for the doctors and other people to come and check. No, as soon as because platelets are kept in a platelet agitator in the blood bank, so as soon as it is delivered to the ward, you should check the uh, the unit, and you should transfuse as soon as possible. So that is because of the risk of infection only, or because of the loss of efficacy. Well, the loss of efficacy mostly because uh, uh, if they're going to be just sitting on the counter then uh, they you may start to see clumping because they're not in the agitator anymore and we uh, and again uh, blood is uh, all components are a precious resource and platelets are always in short supply uh, so we want to make sure that the patient gets the full benefit of the platelets that are transfused right and then on the transfusion time for ffp one bag of ffp would be within half an hour uh, you know uh, uh, it's stored in the blood bank and sent to you and you can transfuse because usually ffp is going to be used in situations where there is coagulopathy or bleeding and so you would want to give it again fast and uh, ffp contains all the coagulation factors uh, and uh, some of the coagulation factors like factor 7 have a short half life so again give it to the patient 
so that they get the benefit of it and within half an hour it should be transfused but again make sure that you're checking the identification and everything before it is checked and monitor the patient for any reactions because all uh, all component therapy are biological agents and reactions can happen even with good matching so patient monitoring is also important Ma'am, what is ma'am? You know, as FFP is a volume expander, and sometimes our patients are volume expanded, and the risk of pulmonary edema is there. So, can we go a little slower sometimes on FFP? Like, what is the maximum duration? If it can be extended a little. So now you have to decide if the patient, if FFP is the right product for you, or if you want to go for cryo precipitate. So, in some patients where you you uh, have a coagulopathy. depending on the cause of the coagulopathy another very good option can be cryo precipitate because you will be getting fibrinogen you will be getting many of the factors like factor 8 um and the volume is less so uh, if you have a patient where volume is a problem you may want to opt for um uh, cryo precipitate in place of ffp but again it depends on the indication if you have for example a liver failure patient where you may want some of the other coagulation factors like factor 7 9 they are not available in cryo precipitate and in those patients ffp is a better choice the other thing that we sometimes do for these uh, uh, patients who have dic or liver failure we may give the ffp twice a day rather than giving all of it in one go you can give it in the morning and you can give it again in the evening and again that is given because some of the factors like factor 7 have a very short half life so if you're giving it only once a day the patient may not have a, a good coagul uh, coagulation profile for the whole 24 hours right ma'am ma then coming uh, to the question of fever ma'am gen there's a general uh, statement that uh, patients having fever should not be transfused so <laughs> so so we are hematologists and we treat leukemia patients and lymphoma patients who often have fever so if they are already febrile having an infection then there is no contraindication yes after giving an a, a transfusion if there is a fever then we do need to check if this fever is due to the transfusion um or if it is uh, something unrelated and so if we have a patient who comes to the day care he's absolutely a febrile and fit and maybe half an hour into the transfusion he gets a fever then obviously this warrants an investigation we should make sure that we are checking and doing the uh, the uh, hemovigilance uh, to make sure this is not a transfusion reaction but or if it happens uh, you know somewhere towards the end of the transfusion but if you have a patient who's already febrile we know he has a pneumonia um, it is not a contraindication right ma'am so the other thing is ma'am uh, if the patient develops fever on transfusion which you think is because of transfusion then yes. it should be stop and send back to the you cannot continue with that that i think is clear uh, that is absolutely imperative and uh, sometimes we are not investigating transfusion reactions there are many causes uh, uh, one it could be improper storage or it could be something uh, in the blood itself or it could be a compatibility issue uh, uh, even minor blood group mismatches and there are many other causes there could be patient related factors also that could be involved so um, we obviously don't want to have any complications so any uh, thing that could be a transfusion reaction should be investigated and again a good discussion with your blood bank is very very helpful um then coming to ma'am uh, about the infections in your practice how serious are and how frequent are infections and sepsis as a complication of transfusion and which component like i think stp is the one which causes most Uh, you know we'd like to comment on that any particular organisms the frequency of infections so we actually have uh, uh, have not seen too many infections and i think that's because uh, 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 we have a very strict policy but uh, uh, the, when it comes to transfusion reactions trali is very commonly seen but um, as as i said our all our blood is pre storage leuco depleted we have nat testing for all our components uh, uh, the blood units are transfused uh, as soon as they come so um, i i really can't comment but i know that most centers are not lucky enough to have the kind of uh, blood bank support that we have um, but 
blood still we still see trali we still see so many uh, taco uh, lots of complications are there are we have patients who have um uh, factor 13 deficiency factor 7 deficiency and they come regularly for getting ffp and they often get reactions and over time we need to make sure that they get pre medications with all their ffp so uh, uh, reactions are there but infections um we don't see so uh, dr tiwari sir one question for you suppose if a transfusion is going on with the pap cell or with ffp or hdp and sometimes it has to be stopped for some reason you know it happens not infrequently in the icu so sir then what is to be done it has to be stopped and re can we put it in the fridge or should we send it back or what is uh, to be done for each component pap cell and ffp and hdp i think uh, you know i cannot really generalize we'll have to talk on a patient to patient basis you know for how long the interruption was there and you know, whether we can restart the unit or we need to discard that unit uh, generally the thumb rule is that if you have disconnected uh, or stopped it or discontinued it for some reason then it's not a very good idea to you know restart the same unit at least you know you can take uh, another unit from the blood bank Uh, i would also like to uh, add to what already madam has said that a lot of times when you have a risk of pulmonary edema or congestive heart failure uh, there are physicians who use diuresis so you can use diuretic along with the transfusion to uh, you know avoid that kind of problem uh, pediatric bags are available very easily now every blood bank has a sterile docking device so it can be tailor made you can have 20 ml 30 ml 40 ml whatever you want Uh, you just have to ask for it and it's uh, you know can be done uh, another advantage is about pediatric uh, alley cots is that you know from one unit you can uh, give to the same patient several times and reduce the donor exposure you don't expose the patient to sub seven donors or eight donors from a single unit you can give all those seven uh, or eight alley cots over a period of time say three days or something right So, uh, ma'am, coming to a few questions on hematology. What about the role for WBC transfusions? We don't uh, I mean, we use really WBC transfusions, and if not, why? So, uh, there are specific indications for WBC transfusion. One is in bone marrow transplant patients before engraftment if they have a serious infection. We also use WBC uh, um, transfusion in aplastic anemia patients because they are severely neutropenic, and if they get an infection, um, it may help. The ideal way of giving a uh, uh, granulocyte transfusion is a single single donor apheresis, in which the donor is given uh, GCSF um, and steroids, and uh, it is very important to irradiate the product before giving it. Uh, uh to reduce the risk of uh, transfusion associated graft versus host disease um uh, often it is difficult to get a donor uh, for this um and the other thing that we often use particularly for pediatric patients or lower weight adults is buffy coat and that's very easily available and the blood bank um is uh, will have the buffy coat uh, uh, available as a by product of their component therapy and that can be irradiated and used there's not that much literature on it but many hospitals use it as a practice in such patients um the data supporting this in icu is less uh, but in hematology oncology patients um most of my colleagues uh, in situations when their back is against the wall um uh, a lot of people do use it and um it it works if you think that the patient is going to recover in a few days and you need a few uh, days of support but you need to be uh, make sure that it is irradiated right. then what about the use of gcsf won't uh, i mean if they are because they produce uh, wbc is very fast so i guess okay. there would be limit right so Uh, that's a very good point now uh, uh, gcsf um, uh, since you asked about wbc i was talking about that but gcsf uh, is again um, if the bone marrow is healthy then the recovery is going to be quick so now if the patient has bone marrow suppression from any cause either post chemotherapy post radiation or due to sepsis then giving gcsf may help but it often takes 6 uh, uh, to 7 days for the effect to come so a lot of times i see uh, doctors giving 2 days of gcsf you're not going to really see a response then 
um uh, and uh, because if the bone marrow is suppressed it will take time for the bone marrow to recover and then only the granulocytes will improve so it may be used there's uh, um, there's no contraindication even in leukemia patients to using gcsf but if they receive chemotherapy it may take 3 or 4 weeks for the bone marrow to recover and for uh, and in these patients the by using gcsf um, especially in leukemia patients you may see a benefit of one or two days All and right. so and yeah if you're in the suppression phase that may take a long time for you to see the effect right and then one question a uh, very practical question which uh, we face is the f- development of fever uh, you know related to blood transfusions so uh, for how long after the blood transfusion can we get fever because we have to decide whether this is a blood transfusion that has caused the fever in the icu or something else is ca- causing it right so it, uh, tem- if you get a temporally related blood transfusion reaction within a few hours or a day then it's easier to tell but you're correct there may be patients who may actually go home and they may not have the um uh, uh, fever for a few days and that is sometimes uh, difficult to note and, and and these are probably missed um so i don't have data on that but obviously if the patient is in the hospital and if they've recently had a transfusion then along with infections it's important to uh, to remember that this may be a delayed transfusion reaction and uh, investigations should be done to follow up for this and uh, as i said trali taco all of these complications are also very common and often under reported but uh, just specifically about febrile non hemolytic reaction fever that that can occur up to like up to 24 hours i would say maximum Or absolutely absolutely it can and in fact they can they, they can even occur a few days later so okay. uh, it's important to uh, if if you if the patient is critically sick if they've recently had a transfusion uh, uh, and if they're in the icu you can monitor the urine if you that can sometimes tell you if some hemolysis is happening you may have some low grade hemolysis going on you may have fever if that is go, if that is the scenario then this could be a transfusion reaction and uh, you can investigate and then see what units they received and uh, so that in the next transfusion uh, you can um, kind of decide and make some changes if required right ma'am right so uh, coming now i'm finally to sepsis and you know thrombocytopenia and dic which is very you know common and very important to us uh, what about you know transfusions of hdp in patients with thrombocytopenia who are not during uh, in uh, sepsis so the, uh, what was i mean prophylactic transfusion of platelets so the guidelines actually do not recommend prophylactic transfusions now uh, the practice sometimes is different because once platelets are low and you know people start getting nervous but there's actually no benefit to doing prophylactic transfusions in dic patients if they're not bleeding if you have a bleeding patient then it's a different scenario but not bleeding critically ill only thrombocytopenia and also the thing you have to look at is it, one the th- the platelet destruction could be uh, because of the dic itself or it could also be due to antibiotics and other drugs that we give in the icu so this uh, often it is multifactorial so um, uh, but prof- it's it's important to have platelets available but prophylactically the guidelines do not recommend using platelets Uh, absolutely ma'am but the practices uh, ma'am are actually very different yes i i agree no, and, and as an oncologist i also know the family will be putting pressure your colleague sometimes put pressure <laughs> and you do it but it's important to know that the patient may often deteriorate you also have to be very careful with what drugs are going on because patient on amphotericin you need to keep a gap of at least 6 hours between using um, a, uh, your stp and amphotericin because again these patients may end up with a trally like uh, a problem so uh, you have to think of all the drugs that you're using and other fluids and other components and transfusion and uh, uh, i mean i'm really happy that now a lot of things are becoming more uh, uh, evidence based and most of our icu colleagues are following the restrictive guidelines for packed rbc transfusion but i think in our country platelets are always a little bit tricky and often they're given more for uh you know making the numbers look better rather than uh, uh, the evidence 
And ma'am, what about the hemoglobin target? You are happy with the, uh, around seven to eight for most of the patients in the ICU? Yes, and I think there is enough data now to show uh, in uh, even in bleeding patients and non-bleeding patients who are in the ICU, and even hematology oncology patients that giving uh, uh, doing the restrictive practice is quite good enough. Unless you have a patient who's like a, a trauma patient or you know, uh, uh, really happy. yeah, then it's different. But otherwise, uh, uh, seven to eight is quite good enough. Okay, ma'am. Just thank you so much. Just uh, last couple of questions before, ma'am. Uh, what about uh, the treatment for DIC, especially purpura fulminans? You know, there has been a recent uh, study a review article in any gym They talked about giving activated protein C and uh, antithrombin three and basing. So, are we uh, there anywhere? And you know, even your take on this? Because we so, uh, is very common. And we yes. So, um, in practice, these components um, have been tested. But uh, at the same time, even though you do have some papers w who talk about these in DIC, the, uh, uh, the evidence uh, and the guidelines still say treat the cause. Uh, uh, give component therapy as needed and um, at the moment no, none of the guidelines recommend any of these agents uh, because they don't have a survival benefit and I think ultimately we must remember that the goal of therapy is to make the patient survive and simply using components or using these products when we don't know how to use them it is a little tricky um, and, I, and I think for these patients in, with DIC, it's very important to do the point of care test um, because they are at risk not only of bleeding, but also of thrombosis. And thrombosis can sometimes be um, uh, much more dangerous than bleeding. And so using a TEG or a Rotem can sometimes guide you if you're using uh, um, any of these agents or if you're using component therapy because uh, you don't want to do any harm. Ma'am, you think uh, TEG and Rotem is uh, better than the standard uh, testing we do for even sepsis-related coagulopathy or is it restricted to liver disease and uh, trauma-related uh, coagulopathy? So, the basic tests are useful, uh, uh, but uh, you have to, but the TEG and Rotem can give you a point of care kind of uh, idea. All, actually, you, we need a global uh, uh, kind of assessment. So there's the physiological assessment, monitoring of the patients, and then all the laboratory investigations that we have. I At the moment, I would actually say that the tests that we have are insufficient. But what we can do is we can do a battery of everything and give it, uh, get an idea and, and get a trend of what is happening. So whatever we have available, I think we should use it. And if you're using, um, you know, antithrombin-3, if you're using uh, FFP, if you're using platelets, then at least, you know, uh, do whatever monitoring you can so that you don't overdo it uh, and end up in thrombosis. Okay. Right, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for your expert comments and very valuable inputs and very, uh, you know, useful inputs practically because these are day-to-day -day challenges uh, which our intensivists face. So uh, before we conclude, we just like to highlight for our audience that kindly monitor the patient on blood transfusion. It should not be that the blood transfusion is going on and uh, we are not monitoring the patient. Please check the blood, uh, keep an eye on the blood pressure, uh, look at the urine output, the color of the urine, look for fever and look for desaturation. Uh, no, desaturation, like ma'am mentioned, trally is very common. It can occur with anything, either with PRBC or with uh, FFP or with HDP. So, commonest with PRBC and TACO can again occur. So, how do you differentiate between trolley and TACO? On the X-ray or on the SATs, you both have the same picture. SATs will fall, X-ray bilateral infiltrates. So, TACO will be volume overloaded, right? You look at the echo, uh, the ventricles will be full. You look at the IVC, the IVC will be full. While in trolley, the patient will be you volumic, I mean, a, a hypervolumic patient can also be trally, then it can be really difficult. But a trally patient will generally be you volumic or hypovolemic as the case may be, and he can develop a little degree of hypotension and fever because of immune mediated reaction. So, it's important to distinguish because TACO can be easily corrected if you give diuretics, you remove the fluid. So, trally and TACO should be kept in mind, monitor the patient, and then again, uh, for uh, uh, prophylactic transfusions, like ma'am has uh, said, 
try and avoid transfusions, which we all do. You know, once the platelet count touches around twenty thousand, we start transfusing. Uh, please be uh, careful about that. Restrictive policy should be used in the ICU and for central line placements. A uh, count of like search showed twenty to thirty thousand is adequate of uh, platelets. So. Those are the things, and the other thing is uh, when you look at the platelet count, you have to look at the PT and the APT also uh, about deciding transfusion and the overall criticality of the patient. Just one particular number is not uh, the only way to go about it. So I think uh, that is uh, all uh, we have to say. If there are any questions or anything, ma'am or sir wants to add, and if there are any questions, please let me see. Uh, one way of avoiding trally is using male only plasma yes that's absolutely right so male only uh, 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 that's correct uh, so any other questions are there let me see how can we avoid trally and specific treatment so uh, any the so one is you have to use uh, male only uh, plasma that is uh, correctly said, and I think uh, even the Rh factor uh, also helps. Uh, multiple pregnancies it should be uh, avoided from uh, female patients. If you are transfusing, then multiple pregnancies uh, should be avoided for, from the donor. Anything else, ma'am? You want to add uh, one of the ways how to avoid trolley? Sir, you want to? Uh, I think Dr. Asim Tiwari sir, you are muted, ma'am. Uh, it, it's very difficult to completely eradicate trolley. I don't think it's possible, and uh, we uh, we we are not always so lucky as to only have male-only plate uh, uh, plasma. Uh, so I think it, good monitoring most of the time. If you uh, recognize it early, uh, patients will recover. So. Uh, uh, I think it's un unavoidable in a busy hospital to, to have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. mortality with trally is not high. If you manage it properly, you may have to put him on an IV, even uh, depending on the situation, may have to ventilate also because patients with lung injury are more prone to trally because ultimately it's the interaction of the activated neutrophils with the endothelium. And if there's already something going on in the lungs, trally's incidence is higher, but the modality with trally, if you manage, with your ventilatory support is uh, uh, beneficial. The modality is low vitrally. If managed properly, there is pretty failure. So if there are any other questions? So I think uh, that's about it. So uh, thank you, uh, Tewari sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, uh, thank the audience and uh, thanks, Sipla for providing the digital platform. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much.